Chapter Thirty Four of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirty Four, and yet another. Pasco ran on, easily surmounting the hedges which he had clambered over with difficulty on his way to Coombe Cellars. He reached the track by the water's edge and ran along that without once looking behind him and only paused when he arrived at the point at which he must strike inland, to his left, leaving the river margin to ascend the sloping shaws in the direction of the shed where tarried Kitty with cob and cart. Here he halted, and a chill ran through his arteries, making him shiver and his teeth chatter. He was hot with running, yet withal in an icy tremor, and with a feeling of swimming in his head and sickness at his heart. The thought had risen up in him, an almost tangible thought, that a great beast coiled in his heart, stretching itself, getting on its feet, and turning. The thought was this, that it was not too late to save his brother-in-law. He might return, unlock the store, rush in, and drag the unconscious man down from the heap of coals, through the smoke and flame. The fire had not yet reached him. It was tonguing up the heap, sending the tips of its flames tastingly towards him. The fire was hot breath, but the crust still upheld the man in the sack. Would it be so much longer? As the coals were consumed beneath, there would be formed a great core of red fire, and if Jason moved, the crust would give way, and then, shrieking, unable to assist himself, he would drop into that glowing mass, where the cords would be burnt to free him but only when it would be too late for him to escape. Had Jason already woke from his trance, and was he cuddled up in his sack, watching the approaching flames, crying for help and getting none? Was he tearing at his bands with his teeth, writhing, trying to precipitate himself down the black mound of combustible material in the hopes of being able to roll along the floor to the door? And if he succeeded so far, what more could he do? nothing but watch the fire grow, break out in gushes of scarlet and orange, pour forth volumes of stifling smoke, and then lie with his mouth below the door, gasping for the air that rushed in beneath. Shuddering, Pasco Pepperell stood with eyes open, looking into the night, seeing all this as really as though the vision were unrolled before his naked eyes. He dared not look behind him. His neck was stiff, and he could not turn it. He could not even turn his eyes in the direction of the cellars. Should he retrace his course and free Jason? Could he not rely on Jason to remain silent after this terrible experience? But what if he arrived too late? What if the fire had already broken out and laid hold of its prey? Why should he give himself the lasting horror of seeing what he must then see? And of what avail would it be to the burning man? It was too late. Pasco had taken his line, had cast his lot, and there was no return. He resumed his run up the hill, through the meadows. The wind blowing off the river assisted him. When he reached the field in which was the shed, he knew that Coombe Cellars was no longer visible. There was a shoulder of hill between. But though the cellars might not be visible, the sky overhead might show redness, might throb with light, and lest he should see this, he fixed his eyes resolutely in an opposite direction. In crossing the field he no longer ran. He had lost his breath ascending the hill. He walked slowly, panting, and ever and anon stopped to wipe his brow and remove his hat, that the cool wind might play about his wet hair. The qualm of conscience relative to Jason was overpassed, and now Pepperell congratulated himself on his success. Now, all was as could be desired. There was nothing to implicate him, no one to turn evidence against him, except there was one person, and one only, who was a danger to Pasco. One person, and only one, who knew that he had been to Coombe Cellars after having ostensibly left it. One, and only one, that he had been on the spot precisely at the time when, presumably, the fire broke out. If Kate Quorm were to speak, then what he had done was done in vain. The company would refuse to pay the sum for which his stock was insured, and he might be suspected of having caused the death of his brother-in-law. 
Would not Kate speak when she knew that her father was dead? Might she not make dangerous admissions should there be an inquest? The charred corpse or burnt bones would be discovered when the ashes of the store were removed, and Jason's cart and ass, being in Coombe, would lead to the conclusion that he, Jason Quorm, had caused the conflagration and perished in it. It would be supposed that he had gone to the cellars and, finding it locked and no one within, had taken shelter for the night in the warehouse, where he had lit his pipe, gone to sleep, and inadvertently had set fire to the coals and wool. But then, what might Kate be brought to say if questioned by the coroner? Pepperell entered the shed and called the girl. He called twice before he received an answer. Then he struck a light, and as the match flared he saw before him the drowsy face of Kate. "'Oh, uncle, what a long time you've been away. I fell asleep.' "'Long time? I have not been a quarter of an hour. I ran to the cellars and ran back the whole way.' "'It has been more than a quarter of an hour, Uncle Pasco. I waited, watching for ever such a time, and then I went to sleep.' "'You are mistaken. Because you shut your eyes, you think the time was long. "'What is that, uncle, you are burning? "'A lucifer match. "'How did you get it alight? "'By striking it on the box. "'How could that light it? "'Is there a tiny bit of flint on the match and steel on the box? "'No, there's not. "'I don't know how the fire comes, but it comes somehow. "'That must be a very curious contrivance, uncle.' Whether curious or not, it is no concern of yours. He struck another match and held it aloft. The girl stood on one side of the cart, he on the other. The lucifer flame twinkled in her eyes. Her hair was ruffled with sleep. As Pasco looked at her by the dying flame, he was considering what to do. He had no doubt that he was insecure so long as she lived. Desperate, hardened, projected along an evil course, could he withhold his hand now and not make himself secure? Would it not be weakness as well as folly to allow this testimony to remain who could at any moment reveal his guilt? But if he were to strike her down with a stake or stone, what could he do with the body? Take care, uncle, said Kate. There's a dry furze here. If the spark falls, there might be a blaze. He extinguished the match with his fingers. He did not desire that his course should be marked by fires. Is there much furze here, Kitty? he asked in a smothered voice. Oh, no, just underfoot. No great heap in a corner? None, uncle. Not enough to cover you over if you were asleep? Kate laughed and answered, I would never lie on furs if I could help it and be covered with it. I should be tormented with prickles. I sat down and laid my head against the hedge that makes the back of the linhay. He was prodding the bedding of the furs with his whip. It is all fresh, said Kate. I reckon Miller Ash is going to turn his cow in here when he has taken away her calf. Ah, she is calved? Yes, last week. True, the cow will be here tomorrow, or in a couple of days. To himself he muttered, It won't do. Then aloud, A jump into the cart, Kitty. We must push on. You drive out. I will open the gate. In another minute, Pasco Pepperell was in his seat with Kitty at his side, driving in the direction away from the cellars. He feared every moment to hear her say, "'Uncle, what is that light shining over Coombe? Can there be a fire?' Instead of that, she said, "'Uncle, did you see nothing of my father? I am quite sure that was he who drove by after we had got into Mr. Ash's field. I heard his voice. I know his way with the donkey. I am quite certain that was father.' "'Your father? No.' never set eyes on him. You were mistaken. I am sure it was my father. I know the rattle of the cartwheel. I say it was not, and take care how you say a word about ever having gone into the field, and about my having returned to the cellars. Why, uncle? Because Ash will summon me for trespass, and because my horse ate the grass. That's one reason. But there's a better one. I don't choose that you should speak." Kate was accustomed to his rough manner, and she did not answer. Then Pasco's mind began to work on the theme that had occupied it before. He had been seen driving out of Coombe with Kate at his side. But what of that? 
would it not be a sufficient answer to give, were she not to be seen again, that he had met Jason Quorum on the road, and that the man had taken his daughter with him, and that thereupon both had perished in the flames? The more he considered the matter, the more essential to his security did it seem to him that Kate should be got rid of. The only embarrassment he felt was as to the means to be employed, and the place where it was to be done. Not till she was removed could the weight now oppressing his mind be cast off. Uncle, said Kate, after a long course in silence, I cannot think how that Lucifer acts, if there be no flint and no steel. How else can the match be made to light? How is no matter to me. Kindle it does, somehow. Then abruptly, Have you got your cotton dress on? The wind is from the east and chilly. Oh, no, uncle. I have on my thick woolen dress, and am very warm. Thank you kindly for considering me. The thick wool, is it? Yes, uncle. Very sure. Very thick and warm. Then that would not do. It had occurred to him to drop a lighted match on her frock, set her in flames, and throw her out into the road at a lonely spot. No, that would not do. He reversed his whip and beat the cob with the handle. "'Diamond is not going badly, uncle,' Kate said in mild remonstrance. He was in reality trying the weight of the whip-handle and the stiffness of the stem. That would not affect his purpose. There was no metal to signify at the butt-end. The horse did not greatly mind a blow dealt it with a full swing of his master's arm. Pasco bore no malice against his niece. In his cold fashion he liked her. She was useful in the house, and saved him the expense of a maid. It was doubtful whether any servant would have been as submissive to Zira as was Kitty, whether any would have continued so long in service to her. He had forgotten his momentary resentment at Kate refusing the offer of Jan Pook. He wished the girl ill for no other reason than his own safety. Had he been able to send her away, out of the country, that would have satisfied him. But as there was no opportunity for getting her out of the way without hurt to himself, she must be removed by such means as were possible to him. How to do this, and where to do it, remained undecided. Not where he then was could it be attempted, for he was now approaching Newton. The lights were twinkling through the trees, cottages were passed with illumined windows, and sometimes with persons standing in the doors. On entering Newton, Pepperell turned his horse's head to make a detour, so as to avoid passing the inn that had been rebuilt, after having been burnt down. For some reason undefined in his own heart, he shrank from driving before that house. In a few minutes the cob was trotting along the Ashburton Road. Pasco looked behind him. He heard the sound of the hoofs of another horse, and the rattle of other wheels. Some traveller was on the road that night. Uncle, said Kate, I think the moon is going to rise. I suppose so. Will it not be grand on the moor, with the moon shining over it, and the dart flowing like silver below? Silver? I wish it were silver, and I'd pocket it, growled Pasco. Dang it! What is that which is following? He slackened his pace, but the conveyance did not pass him. It approached, and the driver was content to keep in the rear. Will you go on? shouted Pasco, turning his head. No, we remain as we are answered the driver. How far are you going? To Ashburton. Well, thought Pasco, the loneliest, wildest part of the road is that between Ashburton and Brimps. End of chapter 34